Hello, Hive Nation. Welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Each week, we have leading experts in personal and professional development share their journeys and expertise to help you connect, engage, grow, and evolve. This episode of the Hive Nation podcast is sponsored by Lost River Distillery, vodka crafted by hand, enjoyed by the best. Guest uh, back today with us on the program is Mr. Bill Carson. Bill is coming to us from Sydney, Australia. Um, we've had Bill on uh, a little while ago. He uh, absolutely uh, knocked it out of the park for us uh, during November, and. Uh, so we thought we'd like to have Bill back on and as kind of a, a follow-up conversation as to our original topic of anxiety, depression, um, how to how to maybe get over that or, or how to help out during those times. And, you know, so we're going to continue on that, that topic today and we're going to go into the feelings of the uh, anxiety and depression and, and those feelings that you do have as you uh, go through those emotions. So, uh, Bill, welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Mm, fantastic thank you guys it's such a pleasure and honor to uh be invited back thank you you bet so uh if you want to kick us off for uh as to you how you see feelings that that get involved in those type of emotions uh i think that's a great way to uh, place to start Mm, okay fantastic uh so it, it, it is this whole topic of emotions and feelings is i think incredibly fascinating um, it, it's interesting for me right off the bat that, for example, we talk about mental health these days. And to me, I think there's not a human being on the planet who has thoughts without feelings. And and then a way to kind of think about feelings and feelings and emotions is that the feelings will generally, and then there's no, it's difficult to be purely sort of definitional about this but a way to kind of broadly think about it is is we have the feelings and then we apply some form of thinking uh, to those feelings and then we have an emotion so so a way of kind of thinking about that as one example would be you know I think I've shared the traffic example you're driving along someone cuts you off and in that moment then we uh, protect ourselves physically and then we'll have some feelings of, of, of uncertainty, of maybe some fear. And then what we as humans do, we'll apply some form of thinking to that experience with some version of, let's say, for example, how dare you do that to me? <laughs> that could be one version. Uh, sometimes the a version of thinking could be stupid driver or why is this happening to me? You know, I, I'm, my life is just sucks at the moment and everything. So you see what I mean? So there's a, a series of thoughts that we apply. And then depending on what that thought might be, then we'll emote. So let's say, for example, if it is a reaction like, how dare you, <laughs> then there'll be lots of verbal and finger gestures. <laughs> Uh, for uh, you know in, in terms of the reaction and the interesting thing is that for most vast numbers of people when we have we don't have the self-awareness around our stress reaction uh that we just um just we just react and people will, will say things like well that's who i am you know um you know my partner does things to me my children uh, press my buttons you know well these are uh, um, the, the habitual reaction to the to to the, the stress reaction, either to externalize their stress reaction and to attack others, or internalize attack self, uh, or um, go into freeze mode and do avoidance denial and, and so forth. 
so so part of the my understanding of the of in, in a sense the whole feelings journey is is in a sense to be able to kind of move and I know, I know for me it'd be interesting lovely to hear from you guys as, as to as to your own a sense of feelings I know for, for myself uh, the the over the years overall my core uh, set of feelings have moved into the happier range I generally am I'm a much happier human being these days because I'm not having the feelings of of, of dread, of uncertainty, of kind of fear. What do people think of me? What's happening in the world? I don't have those feelings in the mind uh, anymore. Um, they'll be, pop in a little bit from time to time, but but largely because I've done a lot of, a lot of work on myself to to um, uh, really heal a lot of the negative feelings towards positive feelings. Um, you know that that's that's. And for me personally, I think really having that awareness and connecting to to you know my feelings is is really important and our feelings. what What are your thoughts? How do you guys feel about that? <laughs> you know, I think we all have our our moments or our days, but you know for myself, it's mostly off of positivity, right? So I feed off of positivity. So I'm not mm. going to get involved in any kind of you know, negative uh, connotation conversation that's going to drag me down, right? I, in the past, I used to, right? And that's kind of the way that it was. And, and I hate to say that I, the older I got, the wiser I got, but it, it seems to have worked that way. And of course, mm -hmm. experience happens like that, no matter what. But um, so I think that the fact that that, you know, if you can always find the positive in something like there's going to be people that get pissed off at that no matter what. And I kind of, uh, I kind of welcome that. So if you're, if that bothers you, why don't you tell me why that bothers you? But for the most part, if we can all be positive, it's going to make everybody else around us, right? Better. And uh, there's obviously, like I said, there's going to be moments where we're going to be like, uh, you know, uh, frustrated or, or, uh, you know, find a negative Nelly, something uh, that happened. Uh, but for the most part, if you can always find the, the positive in it, like, you know, it just kind of, uh at the end of the day if you reflect back on on what you actually took out of it you, you know it's probably it was probably worth its weight in gold that you did a positive reaction rather than a negative reaction yeah a absolutely and um you know there's an enormous amount of science now that really backs up the incredible importance of positivity and the the you know a lot of people used to you know, I've heard it said. You know, oh, you, you're just being ridiculous. You're just being Pollyannaish. It's not. It's not. It's not real. Um, but the reality is, what happens is that um, at a neurobiological level, what it, what it's doing when we do positivity is we actually shift the capacity for thoughts and feelings to different locations in the brain, and like a a transition point is to essentially get out of the negativity, uh, out of the, the stress brain and, and come into the present moment. That's kind of like the fundamental thing, thing that needs to be done to downregulate the, the um, um, a sympathetic nervous system, stress reaction, and then to you know, activate the, the peace one, the parasympathetic one, which settles down the system when we come in, into the present moment. And then that'll potentially stabilize thinking and, and feeling um, over time. And then by a, a, a additional, um, well, again, science-based, uh, really useful thinking and feeling is gratitude. And, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have done the experiment, but, but it's an incredibly useful experiment. And I'd really encourage people out there who, maybe struggle with quite a lot of frustration, feelings of negativity towards what's going on in the world. And I did this experiment many, many years ago where I just started doing what I call 3G, you know, three gratitudes a day. And just you just start with the really basic stuff and just write it up in a little book or put it in your phone or whatever. Um, you know, I'm grateful that I'm alive. I'm grateful that I've got a roof over my head. I'm grateful that I've got a fee. I'm grateful that I either have a job, don't have a job, et cetera, et cetera. And what the focus on the gra uh, gratitude does, it, it actually activates 
a focus on what we do have rather than what we don't have. There is, it's, it's predicted by the World Health Organization that depression will be the major mental health illness by the year 2030. And one of the big issues that happens with depression is what I call DHD, don't have dis-ease. So when we, when we have loss experiences, when we have the don't have the experience of, of, of the love of that person, that's very, very difficult for us as humans because we've got incredibly high attachment needs and so when we when we don't have either the love of somebody or don't have a thing that we do love when, when we don't have something if we focus on the in a sense the don't have or the emptiness of that then that does minor or major sort of squirts of you know sadness and grief and and loss and you know and i i, I did this for many years i'd sort of be constantly um, feeling less than, you know, this is kind of one of the big problems of the stress reaction that internalizes, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, so, you know, I, I'm less than, and, and I don't have the car, I don't have the money, I don't have, I don't have, and, and this just drives millions of people on the planet, and the advertising industry just runs the whole racket, to constantly show people things that they don't have. And then therefore we give ourselves those feelings of despair. So when we learn to uh, stop focusing on the don't have and actually focus on the gratitude of what we do have, then it's, um, it's an incredibly um, helpful um, healing process to stop being and aggravating the, the capacity for depression. So, with that in mind, actually, Bill, uh, I have a question for you. That's it's this not this isn't a new thing, but this is a question that I have for you. So, is it possible then to rewire your brain and or build new neural pathways in order to get out of the negativity all the time and be and get back into positivity? Is there a way to literally rewire the brain to stop the negative, uh, you know, your negative thoughts all the time? Yeah, absolutely, and and now you know neuroscience is proving this through the whole plasticity of the brain, that uh, through the process of developing new habits, new patterns of thinking, and patterns of feeling, and and this is one of the things that I've really again noticed, and you know again you see it in vast amounts of research that uh, when we bring our feelings into play as well. So just that example that I was sharing there, one, the one uh, pattern or, or one way of rewiring uh, to move out of the negativity into the positivity is to uh, do three Gs, uh, so, so doing gratitude. And then what one would start to notice, and this has been my experience, is that as you start to become more aware of what we do have rather than what we don't have, then one time I, you know, it's always been said that, you know, there's so much abundance around us. And then one time I was out walking the dog and all of a sudden I looked up and I just looked at all the trees and I just, like, there's so much. A tree just doesn't have one leaf <laughs> and all of nature and grass. It just there's so much abundance. And then, so that's, again, a way to kind of just think into, in, into that experience. And then, so, um, yeah, an additional range of, of rewirings is, is noticed when the stress reaction fires up, then um, 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 act, act, um, activate the breath and come in, settle it down, come into the present uh, moment. And, you know, Eckhart Tolle's work, the power of now, coming into the now, coming into the present moment. Um, George, uh, J um, James Nestor's work around the breath. So, um close the mouth and just breathing through the nose. Um, you know, all mindfulness meditation practices have, have breath attached to them. And then, you know, more advanced um, meditation mindfulness practices will actually notice uh, the feelings, uh, notice the thoughts, 
uh, notice awareness, you know, all of these kinds of things which over time develop, um, you know, new practices, new capabilities to um, yeah, move into, into happier. <laughs> I was, I heard um, Oprah and um, um, what's his name, Arthur Brooks talking about uh, his latest work. I think it's named Arthur and the whole idea of happier. I think happy is really good. I like happier. So is that <laughs> like, you know, how, how is that, is that, is it even possible then to build new, uh, new neural pathways or is that just something that is, that really just doesn't exist? Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely possible, and I think um, it's a really good theme for people to be uh, mindful of. And I heard this many years ago: is to be a scientist of our own experience. You know, and so what does that mean? Well, okay, you might hear about these things. You might sort of either want to give it a go or, or, or um, think that it's you know ridiculous. Well. Try it on. Um, try, you know, if you find yourself grumpy all the time and absolutely stressed out by kind of what's happening around the world, which is largely driven by the media, then try the experiment of doing uh, three Gs per day, three gratitudes per day, and just keep at it and keep at it. And encouraging, like often when parents hear this, they'll say, oh, yeah, okay, this is a good idea. Let's encourage the, the children to be grateful instead of always complaining that, that they don't have this and don't have that so let's be let's be grateful for what we do have let's and then let's have the feelings of gratitude around that as well so it's not just thoughts but actually notice the feelings and so sometimes the feelings can be um a bit difficult because because the feelings are being habituated to the to the negative so start to feeling positive and, and incorporate those and there's from all the research that I've seen, vast evidence that it does um, change the wiring in the brain. I really like your note there on the scientific side, on the exploration. Uh, I talk a lot about that to my clients and the kids that I coach in judo because uh, it's something mm. that I, I practice. So I do a daily power list, so like five things I do every day. And we, we do a weekly big three, so the big rocks of the week. When I started doing those, I would put in very mundane things like being grateful for, you know, the opportunities that have been presented with, with the people around myself. And until very recently, uh, when Isaac Miller, he was on the podcast a while ago, he said something that really has stuck with me since I've been blessed with a lot of life in a little bit of time. That's me at, at 25. You know, I have a lot of opportunities in front of me because of the mentors that I've been around with, the great people like yourself I get to talk to. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of life experience because of that in a short amount of time. So with gratitude, I hate the question, how are you today? Everybody says good. So I've been <laughs> trying to challenge myself to do this to people, especially my clients. I go, tell me something that's challenged you today and something you're grateful for today. I don't care mm -hmm. how you're feeling, which I, you know, it's not always true, but I want to know what challenged you and how we can work around that. And I want to know what you're grateful for today. Yeah. Especially when yeah. they are, you could feel that tension or if my athletes come on the mat and you could just tell that they are anxious, they're mm -hmm. angry. It's like, if I ask them how they're feeling, they're just going to, oh, that's the worst day ever. And they don't know how to channel that yet. So it's okay. What's mm -hmm. challenging you? What are you grateful for? Yeah, that's good. It's it's extremely good. The probably the way to kind of also uh, talk about this topic is some people will then habituate to catastrophize, and they'll roll it right out to, oh, that's ridiculous. Who could be grateful for you know the insane situation that's happening in Israel and Palestine at the moment? And that's true. But, you know, going, tr trying to apply, you know, gratitude in a, an incredibly complex situation like that is, 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 is a bit insane. Um, so what, you know, the fundamental essence here is that um, 
you know, as, as we manage ourselves, you know, it's it's the Stephen Covey um, circles of control. Uh, as I control myself, I control the loving things that I say to the people around me, or I'm a grumpy bum and I hurt people. Um, so I so I control myself, and then I then influence others. But things that are happening kind of way out, you know in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world, I can't control. And, and you know, a lot of people get themselves all bent out of shape over worrying about that kind of stuff. Well, just come right back into your own home, you know, into your own head, into your own heart. Are you a nice, pleasant person right now, today? Are you gracious? Are you kind? Are you, you know, just in the family situation? You know, Barbara Fredericton's work uh, and John um, Gottman's work around the ratio of positivity to negativity, which we know with at least three to one, five to one, seven to one, um, just saying loving things like, you know, thanks for doing the dishwasher, thanks for, you know, uh, cleaning up your room, thanks for, um, you know, making dinner, thanks for doing the dishes, you know, thanks for doing it. You know, really, really incredibly grateful, you know, uh, simple stuff. Um, but it's in, so important that uh, because otherwise, if you don't do that, then you just focus on, well, you didn't do the, you know, you didn't put away the dishes. Why are you making me dinner? It's like, and then you start all this rubbish that's just insanely. And and people have got to realise a lot of that stuff just coming out of their own, their own selves, their own projecting, their own, uh, a sense of distress that's going on inside them. So as we settle ourselves down, get out of our stress reaction, stop trying to find fault, blame others or blaming ourselves, and then, you know, shift into being a more peaceful human being, more caring and loving and kind and compassionate. And, um, you know, uh, Paul, Paul uh, Gilbert's work around compassionate mind uh, again, applies really good science as to just how important this is and how necessary it is um, for just each individual being, you know, feeling in a good place and also then creating um, goodness around them. I'll start. Thanks for showering today, Greg. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and you two guys too, because you complement each other. You and 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 it's interesting when we, uh, if you take the word complement, you can do a C O M P L E M E N T, which means we kind of go together. And then you, you change the E to an I, C O M P L I E M M E N T, is then when we do a complement to the other. Mm. And uh, you know, and, and 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 I grew up. It was pretty difficult at times. There was, it's kind of like an attitude that I had for quite a few years where, particularly in an early relationship, I remember, I'm not going to be nice to you until you're nice to me. Like, how insane is that? But, you know, it's a lot of people operate like that. And so we got to lead, you got to lead with love, you got to lead with it. And as we do that more and more, and often people can, find that really difficult I think when they don't fundamentally love themselves and this is you know may seem pretty corny but it's it's you know I, I had to you know I got if you've got a pretty um, hurt if you've got a lot of trauma in your early years then there's a lot of healing of the kind of just the basic ego um, and for a while there I found it incredibly helpful to just give myself that internal message I love myself I care about myself I believe myself and I've done that shared that with a lot of people because the the reason is is because um when one is quite hurt uh and and struggling with a really low kind of sense of self sense of I'm not good enough I'm not worthy um then then you can't operate very intelligently, very appropriately, you have lots of negative feelings and hurtful feelings and disruptive, disruptive feelings. So there needs to be a sort of a, um, a, a stabilization of, of that. Um, and 
and so sometimes people can kind of think, oh, okay, that's just on the you know bordering on the on narcissism. Well, no, because narcissism then takes it to the other extreme where where you only ever care about yourself and not about others. So, um, you know, it's 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 about stabilizing one's emotional state so that you can function reasonably effective in the world. <laughs> that's. Uh... That's another topic I think we could probably talk about for another day or eight. But um, Bill, I think you know, we talked about off camera a little bit about, you know, the difference between empathy and sympathy again. And you brought up the, the three stages of, of empathy. I would I'd love to, to, for you to, to expand on that for us. It's, it's a very interesting conversation. We've had other people on here talking about it and the, you've talked about it in the past as well, but it's not as cut and dried as just to, this is the this is what empathy is and this is what sympathy is. So you know, I, I would love to have your take on this again, uh, just as to how you view it and how you've explained it to your you know your clients and in your past. Mm. Yeah. So you're not listening to me. Well, hang on a minute. I heard what you said. I care about you, and. You know, I love you and want to help you solve your problem. And here's what you should do. You're not listening to me. So kind of imagine a classic situation. I'm just going to go stereotypical here for a moment. So um, a couple, you know, how was your day, darling? It was terrible. It was so frustrating. I had just the same trouble that I've been having with Billy Bob and you know, it's just driving me nuts. Yeah, my day was really bad as well. And I had, here we go again. You never listen to me. All you ever do is talk about yourself. Oh, yeah, but I'm, you know, I kind of just wanted to share with you how, you know, I'd had a bad day as well. And then, therefore, you would feel that I was listening to you. You're not listening to me. Now here's, here's the challenge. Here's, here's the essence. <clears throat> so empathy versus sympathy. So if we think of um, empathy and, and, and the original words, so pathy is the Greek word uh, pathos for feelings. So empathy, them feelings. And sympathy, sim in the Greek is together, so together feelings. So essentially what we do with sympathy is we're essentially, in a sense, saying that I'm together with your feelings. But the big risk is we, we fill it with an I, you know, I feel for you. I, let me tell you about me. So so think of sympathy as self so self uh, feelings so the thing that we need to realize is let's I'll, I'll give you a classic example so a number of years ago a friend of mine I caught up with he he hadn't um I hadn't seen him for quite some time and he shared with me how he um his wife had died and she uh, had a long battle with cancer and I reflected back I did empathy reflected feelings that must have been so difficult for you to have gone through that experience. And, you know, he kept the conversation going. So I, I reflected back and I kept it about him. And then he, um, later on in the conversation, said to me, no one has ever responded to me that way. They always respond with, I am sorry for your loss. I can't imagine how difficult that would be. They make it an I because for two reasons. One is for this idea that sympathy is essentially together with your feelings. But the other uh, big challenge that vast numbers of people need to realize is that what happens when, uh, when another person shares uh, an experience, a feelings based experience, um, that it, it triggers in us our stress reaction. And if we're not unconscious, what will happen is that our stress reaction will be triggered 
And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll either externalize with um, telling the person what to do um, or we'll internalize uh, and, and again, project in some shape or form. So the, the essence of really good communication here and, and doing empathy is to keep the uh, feelings with the other person, so reflecting them back and not, in a sense, going into our own feelings and projecting our feelings with an I. You know, um, I've had a similar experience or I um, um, know what you're going through. I know how you feel, those sorts of things. No, 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 no. You, you don't know how I feel. You, you don't understand what's better. So I'll give you another example. In Australia, there's a um, uh, our ABC, our Australian Broadcasting Commission, uh, uh, has a podcast called All in the Mind. And they ran a, a session on uh, toxic positivity a number of months ago. And a classic example of toxic positivity is where people try to put a positivity onto a situation that, that someone has experienced. It's very, very difficult and it's really toxic. They're, they're kind of meaning well, but it ends up being very hurtful. And this example was a woman shared how she had one child who was six and um, she'd lost a second child in childbirth and a friend said, well, at least you've got one. And like incredibly bad, trying to be put a positive spin on the situation. But what is needed, what is really effective communication skill is being present with the feelings that's incredibly painful and then feeling the feelings and then reflecting them back you know that must be so difficult for you and painful for you how are you feeling at the moment have you got support and help through through what you're going through and be present with the person's feelings that way then we validate uh, they feel listened to and heard and we're not trying to put any solution, any advice, any projection of ourselves onto uh, their experience. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. Mm. So, so with that, it's really interesting that we're talking about this because I had an interaction literally this morning. Uh, an, an individual reached out to me on Instagram uh, <laughs> about a story of me squatting and they said, Oh man, your squat looks great. I can't do that right now because my knee's injured. I can't wait till I'm back squatting properly. I've had a really bad knee injury. So I'm like, man, appreciate it so much. I totally understand your knee injury. Uh, I hope, hope you're back at it right away. So in that instance, I, the, the response I got back was positive, but is that still, considered not constructive because I put the eye on it or is that yeah, just being relatable it, like I'll just I'll yeah. just add to this is that just being relatable that you know that Greg was just basically you know uh construing his own injury as to the guy who brought up his injury to begin with yeah 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 exactly so um a another way to kind of uh, respond that would be a more pure empathy response that that would save the the I uh, um, more later so to speak is reflecting back because okay he says he says he's had having difficulty squatting by you going straight into, oh, you know, I've had a similar experience and, yeah, I've had a bad need. So you then bang your eye straight over the top of his. So in theory, a better, well, you know, in terms of what I'm sharing, would be make something like that is so frustrating. That is, that must be, you know, quite um, um, difficult for, for you and, and uh, are you in pain when when those uh, squats happen? You, you see what I mean. So the conversation stays stay straight with him, you, and he goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, well, you know, I got in pain, and um, you know." And then what, what have you been doing to actually sort of help you, yourself progress through, through that? And so you keep the conversation with him, and then there might be uh, then a place where, yeah, and I 
I can really relate to what you're sharing there because I busted my knee and then this is what I found really useful. Oh, mate, did you? It, it, it's, you see where I've gone with this? Yeah. Yep. First of all, the connection is just with the with him and it stays with him. Yep. And then, because this is what a lot of people often ask, well, when do I get to talk about me? When do I get to talk about, you know, my own experience? Well, not initially. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the interesting thing. And I, I like really, really appreciate that, Bill, because when somebody comes forth to you and confides in you with an issue that's purely, you know, emotional or spiritual or mental, it's it's a lot more complex up front. An injury, mm-hmm. like we talked about in the last podcast with you, oh, you have physical health. Oh, I could tell that your shoulder, you're in a sling. That's something I can see. It's pretty straightforward. You're in, your injured, your shoulders hurt. <laughs> But injuries, it's not just physical. There's, mm. I can't do the things I like. Uh, I, I, I had to drop out of nationals because I couldn't, couldn't compete. There's so much mm. more to it than that. But it, because it's easy, it's tempting to put that eye in. So I think that's a really, really important piece that all the listeners should rewind a couple times and re-listen to. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I'll give you an example. I did a um, lifeline shift on Saturday and um, a young girl called and she was pretty distressed. And um, she was, she'd been uh, sacked from her job. She'd been there a year. And the thing that she said that was really distressing was that she would reached out to another friend for some, um, you know, support and help to, talk it through and this friend just pushed back and said you know versions of I don't have the bandwidth um to kind of you know listen to you be with you uh, etc and this is it, it's 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 sad it's 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 un, un, unfortunate that a lot of people don't uh, understand then just how to actually be in relationship with someone when they're struggling and they often either kind of think you know i've got to either have the answers have the solutions or things like that and and so this is where what i'll what i'd like to explain is is how to understand empathy and how to actually then do empathy because if, if we because as we've I've just highlighted here, if we, if we avoid sympathy but we, we do empathy how do you do empathy because i feel the feelings all right, so empathy is at three. Some of the research that I've seen is empathy at three levels, and I this, this model kind of seems to resonate and work for me, and I find it really useful. So the lowest level of empathy is cognitive empathy. In other words, so I can you know think about someone's situation. So if I think about what's going on uh, overseas at the moment in in that in the Middle East area, I can imagine how difficult it is. I don't have the personal experience, but I can. Um, cognitively empathize with what might be going on and the next level of empathy is emotional empathy and that's where we 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 feel so last night I was watching a one of um you know a, a program called police rescue and um a, a guy had got lost in the bush and um he, he somehow got stuck underneath a tree and he was out for 72 hours and then his wife came and you know she was just run 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 you know and you could just feel her her you know the, the, what she was going through um etc so that's emotional empathy compassionate empathy is when we do the work of empathy so com so looking at the latin com is with and passion is pain um which, which is interesting you know or you know how's your passion which is you know how's your pain um so so when we're compassionate with somebody then what we need to notice so if we go back to the situation where you know that woman had lost her child then we we feel the feelings we we reflect them back so we'll we'll have some feelings because if you're a normally wide human being you'll, you'll feel the feelings and you stay present with the feelings the thing that we need to then notice is okay i've got these feelings and i'm being present with the feelings now when if when the conversation finishes uh so if we go back to your example um uh, greg then sorry um, jason 
then um, um, then the uh, connecting with the guy's busted knee is kind of low levels of empathy. You wouldn't have to be, you know, putting too much emotion out to connect with that. So at the end of the conversation, it's like, so you won't have any residual feelings. You know, you just go on doing what you're doing. So let's say, go if we go to the example of the uh, woman who's lost a child. Now, if you've had a situation where either you've had that experience or you know of, you could actually trigger quite substantial feelings. And so those, those residual feelings will actually be kind of lingering. And if, if it's kind of more moderate level and you notice the feelings, then, then that, that's understandable. It's like there's nothing wrong with you. It's just you're feeling feelings and that's okay. We, we, we need to do some sort of self-care to, to dissipate those feelings. So it might be to, I don't know, just go move the body, grab some water, uh, maybe go for a walk, talk to somebody, et cetera. But if the feelings are really actually quite strong and quite lingering, um, and, and this is where, for example, when I'm doing lifeline work where, you know, there are sometimes quite strong feelings, I'll have feelings like, you know, did I really <clears throat> engage in the most effective way? Then, then I need to debrief and, 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 you know, debrief with someone, debrief with a specialist. So again, you know, sometimes people, you know, might be a, bit, a little bit freaked out about this, but in theory, um, you know, if you had really strong feelings around a situation, you know, ringing a helpline because they're the most accessible to just say, look, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I've just got these feelings on, about, you know, the situation or being able to have a, a friend. Um, like I know that there's, I've got at least two or three, four mates. I could just ring up and say, hey, look, you know, I've got these these feelings going on and we just listen to each other and, and you know, and then just feel that those feelings can, can dissipate. So the point is that it's it's not as though there's anything wrong with it. it the equivalent is like you've had a workout and you're just exhausted, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and when we, my my view is that when we connect with our feelings, when we get to debrief our feelings, we actually get stronger, emotionally fitter and stronger. And this where I just are so um, um, so in in a sense so enthusiastic about this that if we as humans just consistently acknowledged our feelings, accepted our feelings, just moderated our feelings, you know, had that self-awareness around our feelings, moderated them, you know, if, if we, you know, cranky and then, you know, back it off, um, do something to nurture yourself. And then if you need to get some additional help, you know, we can do that. We can reach out and, and not be, you know, judged, shamed, blamed, etc. Then what happens, we all get emotionally fitter and stronger. Uh, and more emotionally regulated to be able to handle the, just the, the complexities that exist in, in life as they are. Does that make sense for you guys? The yes. whole kind of doing the work of empathy and then compassion and empathy and then looking after ourselves. So you don't blame, you be present with the other person. I notice then, you know, I'm, I'm give me, giving the gift of being present with the other person's feelings, being present with them. Okay, I notice that that's, uh, demanding in me in some shape or form. So I'll now go away and take personal responsibility for my feelings in some form and not project them onto you. Oh, you know, I'm not going to talk to you again because I get too upset about it. Now, it might be appropriate to put in boundaries, but um, just that's another way of thinking about it. You know, we talk about passion on here a lot uh, about, you know, what's your passion and you should probably should change that because I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not yeah. looking to bring out somebody's pain, right? I, I, I'd rather have what you, what's your, uh, what's a better word for passion, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I haven't answered that one. It's a, it's a really good, um, you know, um, I once, yeah, it was John Martini that I think I first heard it. Um, but then I ignored it because it didn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's purpose. We talked about that with yeah, the many coming purpose. out very soon with uh, Cruz, or it'll be out by the time uh, this podcast is out, uh, Cruz Gamboa. 
we talked about purpose, finding your purpose and understanding yeah. what your purpose in life is. So maybe that's, that's what it is. And it's, again, so grateful for the amazing conversations we get to have on, on the podcast and, and in our network. It's, it's something I've immediately added in. I've, that's another question I ask when people go, ah, I don't know if this job's right for me. I think I need to find something else. Well, what's your purpose? Like, what do you truly yeah. feel your purpose is? When you wake up, what do you need to do? Well, I really like, okay, well, let's build on that. And, and it, it's a less used word. I feel, especially in today's culture, we get attached to these buzzwords and passion seems to be one of them, especially, you know, and it's a great word, but it's become overused. Mm -hmm. There's, there's words that get overused and I, they lose meaning to a certain point, in my opinion, and purpose isn't one that gets used as, as much. So good point. Yeah, I back up that. I think purpose is incredibly important. And um, there's an enormous amount of uh, research work, particularly Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning uh, around it. And there are a lot of people who are not mentally and emotionally well uh, um, because of their uh, the, the lack of uh, uh, sense of purpose. And I really struggled in my uni years, like, what am I doing with my life? Where am I going? What's my purpose? Um, uh, and it, it's the number one existential question. Why am I here? <laughs> so, and and my my uh, sense on that is that is is to make it really simple. I, I just started with my purpose is to make a contribution, and I didn't want to use make a difference because I was a bit kind of up the ego track, but. Everyone's different. I just want to make a contribution. Then I added, make a contribution of love. And then I added, make a contribution of love to humanity. Uh, uh, every day, one person at a time. That's that's my purpose. That's why I, I exist. So just as a, as a refresher, uh, Bill. So the three uh, the three the three E's in empathy. I guess if you want to call it that, would be cognitive empathy, emotional empathy, and compassionate empathy. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially, so uh, just to back up, Bill was on episode 46 of the Hive Nation podcast. So whoever's listening to this, if you want to do a recap and then come back to this one, I would encourage you to do that because that one was very, uh, was very purposeful as well. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, whoever wants to uh, go back and, and look at the cognitive, emotional, and compassionate, compassionate empathy and relate it to yourself as to how Bill just described it, I think it would be a very good um, uh, type, type of, of um, exercise that you could get off and do for yourself that you basically could add to your three G's on a daily basis mm -hmm. to, you know, figure out which ones, which and in, in which time to use which one, because we see it all the time. People use it wrong all the time, right? They, they use empathy versus sympathy all the time. Just like you discussed, uh, Bill, with the that must be versus I know how. Uh, that's a very good way of, of putting it that, you know, just to try and and be, you know, related to somebody versus actually showing that you care, you know, are two different things. And that, that's, it's a good, that's a really good that's a really good message to take out of this today, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic. And just, you know, just wrapping up as we uh, go back to the, you're, you know, you're not listening to me. And, you know, the partner shares, you know, I had a really tough day and, you know, just so frustrated and, and so forth. Then, you know, just so shutting up the sympathy, just reflecting back, you know, that must be really tough for you, darling. Um, how are you feeling at the moment? And, um, um, you know, do you, do you, would you like some sort of support, you know, would, you know, would it work for you if I kind of took over dinner, doing dinner tonight or something like that? So you, you're keeping it at, at the you, keeping it present with, uh, with the other person. And then later on, when that person is feeling listened to and heard and loved and validated and, and so forth, then what will happen is that her emotional resources or her or his Emotional resources come up, uh, they feel good, uh, good to go, re-energized, and then they'll have the space for, and, and how was your day, darling? And then the space gets created for, for the other. 
Uh, no, so, so with that in mind, I have a follow up to that. So is that person looking for validation? Is that what they're looking for when they are when they say to you, like, I had a really terrible day, Bill? Uh, are they looking for validation? Like, is that is that what somebody not not, not I'm not picking on you, Bill, this could be anybody. But is it are they looking for the validation as to uh, you know, how they're feeling or or that their that their day was you know terrible and then they're looking for that validation of that you do understand? Yeah, it's interesting when you use are they looking for validation? Just what do you what do you mean by that specifically? Yeah, are you <clears throat> maybe are you asking you? Know, they just want to be heard. They want to know that they're yeah. being heard. Like you, you mentioned, you said validate in, in what you just said there and validate as in like they are being recognized by the person that's across from them, that they, the person across from them understands or recognizes that they have had a bad day. Not yeah, that they yeah. had a bad day themselves. Yep. Uh, very good. The, the, the perspective I come from is, is if we just reflect back the person's feelings, um, and stay out of stress brain um, um, reactive mode, which is to to judge in some shape or form. So um, just reflecting back. Um, so we're not essentially trying to figure out are they needing validation. They, they're just saying, look, I had a really bad day today, and uh, and then I, you know, do you want to talk a little bit more? That must be so frustrating for you that you know it's happened again. And 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 they could then go, yeah, look, you know, I was just trying to land a message with, you know, Jimmy Jack, but once again, I just feel that he's not listening to me and 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 so forth. So and, and so you just so the whole point is just keeping the conversation with the other person without trying to figure out any judgment, um uh, without trying to solve the problem. Um and, and and in a sense being curious to their own experience. If, if that makes sense, and 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 that sense of compassion to their own experience, which is feeling having the, the feeling and being you know conscious of what they would be feeling, but not. But this is where we the, the idea of just controlling our own thoughts in terms of trying to solve the problem, be judgmental, tell them what to do. It's it's having that that awareness to. Um, in a sense, keep this space between us clean of me trying to fill it with sympathy, judgment, points of view, just reflecting back, allow their feelings to land in there, their thoughts and so forth. So, so they will, it increases the fact that they will feel validated, listened to, heard, etc. because we're not filling the space with our stuff. Does that make sense? It does. The other side of the coin that uh, that I always think about is, you know, what did that person do in order to make that situation better or worse? You know, so you know, if 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 I say to you, Bill, I had a really terrible day today, uh, and and you know, you uh, empathize with me, not knowing that I was a complete asshole to whoever I dealt with that day, and that's why my day was terrible. <laughs> You know, it's, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's almost a catch 22 that, you know, what, what have you done in order to make mm -hmm. the day better or worse? You know, like what have you, how have you taken it upon yourself to make your day better or worse? Yeah. It's so hence, this is a classic because you just can't take a single sound bite and then kind of make that kind of applicable in all contexts. Um, so again, if, you know, if there's, you know, there's this, you can take this into a kind of whole set of different places. Like if every day, um, how was your day, darling? Grind, grind, moan, moan. It's like, okay, now we're into another world of mental health issues. <laughs> That's another conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's, you know, that just starts to talk to the whole kind of relationship and what's going on for the person and uh, and so forth. So in that case, then fundamental advice is, well, this is the same conversation that we've been having for the last five days. Um, where is the gratitude? <laughs> right. Okay, got you. 
I, I totally understand. Well, Bill, we could we could go on again for a long time here. So why don't mm-hmm. you why don't you tell our listeners again where they can find you? Uh, mm-hmm. What you've got going on? What's coming down the pipeline for you? Uh, twenty. This will be in twenty twenty four now. So uh, you know what's what's coming up for Mister uh, Bill Carson. Mm. So the Safe Conversations for Work and Life book that I've written, which is available on uh, Amazon, um, is uh, fundamentally a, a, a in essence, a lot of what we're talking about. And my main goal is to be teaching leaders, managers, team leaders, people in general, but particularly those in kind of corporate organizational context, how to how to actually be able to have safe conversations with their team. Because I think that it's incredibly important that managers uh, know two things. Number one is to know about um, mental health and, and have, have that awareness around their team and and how people might be showing up and what signs might be when, when people are struggling. And then to be able to be uh, safely uh, to have a conversation with the, the person and help them develop uh, self-awareness around their situation. And it's difficult because for a manager, it's teaching managers to, in these conversations, turn off manager brain which is trying to solve the problem, tell them what to do, but to help the person develop them some self-awareness and ultimately, you know, do what they need to do, look after themselves, which will either be self-care activities of one sort or professional activities. So Safe Conversations uh, workshops are a three-hour workshop that that enable managers to do that. So if people want to, are interested in that, um, you know, we can run them all over the world which we are starting to do. And um, particularly in, in Australia, what uh, Australia is now um, um, operationalizing the psychosocial hazards legislation quite um, um, early. And so companies are identifying that a way to upskill their managers is to provide safe conversation skills. And it's also a really good underpinning. So for example, when, um, you know, when you've got to have a difficult conversation with, uh, someone, you know, a team member, uh, difficult or challenging conversation. Sometimes, in a lot of instances, it, it, it might have come, might be coming about because you've seen their performance drop. Um, and so, being able to first of all connect in, have the conversation, and maybe be able to determine if it's a personal issue that's getting in the way of their performance, then helping the person deal with that first is is incredibly important because sometimes we go um you know we go hard on you know poor performance bad person when you know someone might be really struggling with stuff like i know there's many many couple of examples one recently a woman great worker you know in her mid to late 40s but then her performance started to drop off manager was kind of going to get a bit um nasty about it but he decided to have a compassionate conversation found out that she was struggling with her husband who's got cancer and you know he's been having a whole lot of tests and you know things and it's been really really difficult for her and so you know her performance dropped off so rather than being nasty and aggressive being helpful because she's been loyal for years and helping her and you can just then imagine how how that's so so much better for for her and for for others um, by taking that sort of approach. So that's the and then people can connect with me through LinkedIn, uh, Bill Carson uh, on LinkedIn, or my website is inspirelearning.au. Uh, you can kind of contact me that way as well. Awesome, fantastic, Bill. It's a pleasure again. Thanks so much, Hive Nation. We're out.